All right, so is my, just let me know when my screen's showing. I can see you. Awesome. All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is the first week in December, so this means that we are at um, our fourth set of four core words. And so today it's myself, Carolyn, and Mary Louise. In today's webinar, we're just going to introduce the, um, the next set of core four, those high frequency words, and we'll talk about them both, how we use them in core word systems as well as in um, pragmatically organized dynamic displays or pod systems. We'll explore um, more ways to use what we call the expectant pause while we are modeling these words and using these words in the classroom. And we'll take a look at some storybooks and other fun things that um, people like Carol Zangari call communication temptations, right? So those just the kind of fun, um, natural experiences we have with our kids that give us that opportunity to use our core four. So today, in terms of our five steps, the, that, uh, f the five steps being kind of the framework for how we've been organizing this uh, webinar series, the teaching tools we'll be looking at is core word uh, vocabulary instruction in terms of how we can start um, modeling these four core as well as the expectant pause as an instructional activity. And the tools are just in any communication system you're using, whether it be pragmatically organized or core word. And just a reminder, we've been using the Dynamic Learning Maps um, top 40 core words to guide this series um, because it was just the most evidence-based um, kind of ordering of words or prioritizing of words that we could find. The Dynamic Learning Maps uh, comes from the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. and um, uh, they identified the, the top 40 words that students need for communication as well as to be able to participate in a classroom and have language for um, to demonstrate their own classroom learning and their own concept development as well as the words that they need for social communication um, outside the classroom. So for if we were going to be in a situation where someone might have only 40 words, these are the 40 that are considered to be the most essential. So we are at um, row four with the words where, up, on, and in. And just a reminder that core words are just that small set of words that we use very frequently all across the day with a whole bunch of different people. It's really easy as we get our kids started on communication system to focus on those really specific nouns that we know they like, their favorite foods, their favorite people, um, favorite places, favorite activities. Um, but it's also really easy to get stuck there because no matter how much you like a food, maybe it's cookies, you can only say it so many times um, across the day and with so many people before it's now actually considered a challenging behavior to use that word. So what we're emphasizing when we're doing core word, um, when we're just focusing on core words, is making sure that what we're modeling for our kids are those words that that they can use all across the day as often as possible. These are words that are very easily combined and recombined with lots of other words. Um, and so they just have very high utility that way. And core words is also just a term that's used to describe the way that a communication system is organized, how it organizes all the words that are presented. So we talk about core words being those um, high frequency words and fringe words being those particular nouns such as cookies um, or people or places, those, those very specific words that we use much less often, but that um, help us be, be specific. So um, looking at our core for this month, go ahead and take a minute to find these words in your system. If you're a pod user, we'll um, have some specific support for you in just a minute because some of these are a little bit, um, just more, take some more navigation to find but our words are where, up, on, and in. If you don't have a communication system yet, you might be using um, Deanna Wagner's Core Plus Five. So these, she took the DLM's top 40 and added five more words. And so this is a display that we've shared 
um, in the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, the um, Communication Training Series group on Facebook. You can download this. If you don't have a system yet, then this might be a great starting place for you to just start being able to follow the series and developing the habits of modeling um, and just learning how that works. So you can see I've circled in red where we would find these words. Something we've talked about earlier in the series, um, particularly with a uh, Maureen Nevers' uh, presentations is making sure that we're modeling a range of communication functions and a range of um, types of words. And so you can see that um, this month we're focusing on a question word and some prepositions. Um, and one way that we know we're modeling a range of words is if um, when you look at these color-coded systems, the color coding really refers to the part of speech, the type of word it is. And so um, when we're, when we're shooting for a rainbow of words, and we know that we're um, by looking for trying to model words of a whole bunch of different colors, and we know that we're covering many different parts of speech. This is a screenshot of Proloquo, which is just the most common of the apps being used with our kids. And if you've been following the series, um, these were the first four words that we emphasized. Here's the next four, the next. And then here we are this month. And so you can see we're really shooting for that kind of um, rainbow of words, trying to find words across the board. And by, our goal is by the end of this series, we'll have all developed that kind of automaticity of being able to find our words wherever they are in the system, but we'll be able to really model a large range of words um, and we'll have become quite expert at uh, using a few of them often. So this month we're looking at where, on, in, and up. And this is what you're looking at here is the Proloquo uh, 6 by 10. So it's 60 words on the page, and it's something that our speech therapists, such as Carolyn uh, Musselwhite and Marie Nevers, have suggested as a good starting place um, if you're looking at kind of a manageable number of words that most of our students with Angelman syndrome uh, have, would have the fine motor skills or could develop the fine motor skills to be able to access. And I also emphasize two folders. So if you look down towards the bottom, the actions folder and the places folder are highlighted here because as we use words like where, on, in, and up, um, two very common folders that we might go into or two categories of words that we might go into would be places and actions. Now, I'm not suggesting um, that each month you, you provide a background um, the way that I've done here, where you can see the first week's words are, have a background of green and the, this, this month's words have a background of yellow. I'm not suggesting that you do that, for example, each month, but it can be a really helpful strategy just to help all of you, all of the adults who are modeling, remember what those words are. So think of some way to help um, trigger you and others to use those specific words. So if we go back to Deanna Wagner's, you can see that um, I just put a red circle around the words. You can do that. You can use a marker. You can use a highlighter. You can use the editing functions within your system, whatever makes sense to you. But see if providing a visual cue of those words you're targeting helps. Um, other folks have used masking where they actually hide some of these cells and each month they're revealing a few more. So there's lots of options just to help you make it a little bit easier to uh, kind of quickly find those words to help you be able to model them. When we are targeting our core words, we this will be, you know, this is not new to those of you who've been following the series, but we're really just trying to um, do three things. We're trying to strengthen our students' concept knowledge of specific words, right? So chances are most of our students with names will know words like on, off, in, up, those kind of things. Um, but it's unlikely that they're actually using them expressively. We're going to strengthen their concept knowledge around those, make sure that they really do know those words. We're going to help them learn how to automatically access those words, but really we're going to focus on our modeling, so we're going to learn how to automatically, meaning I don't have to think about it, I know my hand knows right where to go to find those words. And what we're really, I think our biggest goal of targeting these core words is just to increase the frequency of how often we use the words by making sure that we're modeling them as often as we can throughout the day. Uh, this month, as we look at the, the, the set four that we're looking at this month, the power of these ones, um, is really that they're great words used in action. And I'll get into that 
next. So the first word is where. Um, I, my experience is that for our students with Angelman, the most often, the, the most frequent use of this word is things like where is X? Can you show me X? Can you touch X, right? So it's used as a question directed at our students where we often already know the answer to. And what we're hoping to do today is kind of shift that use of the word where so we can use it in a lot of other ways. So where just refers to a place. So it's a very high frequency word. We might use it all across the day in terms of any time we're thinking about moving ourselves or others or objects into a different spot. Um, and it's highly social to talk about places, right? And places we might like to go, places we enjoy going, places we went to. So words like where help us with that. It supports choice making because if we really focus on modeling words like where, then instead of just instructing our student where to go, we're more likely to start offering them the choice. Where should we go? When we're modeling words like where, it prompts us to share more information. It's so easy for us to say, okay, it's time for us to go, and to forget to have that conversation with our student about where we are going. Um, or when our students talk about, maybe they use their system or a photo or a sign to say, to say a person's name. The words like where help us um, elicit more information from that student. So, oh, you've said mom. Are you asking where mom is? Or maybe you're asking when you're going to see her. But when we start trying to focus on those question words, then we start sharing more information with our students and we provide more opportunity for them to share information with us. Um, or to ask for more information from us. Um, and words like where really prompt us to make sure that we're actively engaging kids, um, such as where should I put this? Um, and we'll get into that in a bit in terms of some of the activities, especially that we do in the classroom, um, making sure that our students are helping to direct us where we should put things, how we should do it. So we can use where with all kinds of things, such as where is your coat? Where is the cafeteria? Where should we go? Where should I start reading? Where do I write my name? Where is daddy? Um, where should we glue this, right? So by focusing on where, when we model such simple phrases as this, the number one thing I think that this encourages us to do is actually, oops, actually wait for a response. It really prompts us to not just tell our student what to do, but give them some time to see if they can show us the answer. And when it comes to our students with Angelman, providing them time to organize their body to show us what they know, um, that time is often one of the most um, important supports that we can provide to them. So if we focus on modeling words like where, then that actually keeps us occupied so we don't jump in too quick and answer things for them. We can then also remember to model response back. So where is your coach? Where is the cafeteria? It's here, or it's there, or it's not here, it's not there. Um, but if we then take the time, we've given them a pause, we wait for a response, and now we model a response. Um, maybe it was where is daddy, and now we model going into our categories, such as our folder for places, and finding the location where daddy is we're actually giving our students a lot more response time. We're giving our students a lot more processing time. So if we can both model the question and model our response, then um, we might be giving our students the time they need to be able to, uh, to organize Aaron, their response. Go, back to the question. go ahead. Can you go back to the question? Because uh -huh. I want you all to look at the questions and notice that there are not a lot of correct it, there's not a lot of these questions that have just one answer. A lot of these can have more than one answer, and we don't know the answer. I think that's really important. Ask where is your coat when you actually don't know where their coat is, because <laughs> it's a real question. Ask where is the cafeteria when you're somewhere at their school and you don't know where it is, but you know your child does. Asking where should we go, they get to decide. Do you, do you see, I'm trying to talk about these are, do you think these not as test questions, but as authentic questions where we really want to know the answer? Where should we glue this? 
do that if they're more than one place they can glue it. They have a lot of choice in this. Whereas daddy, when we're playing a hiding game or when we really are not sure where daddy is. So just me keeping it real. Ella, and that gets exactly to here. That when we're modeling words like where, we're modeling because we're having a conversation with our student. We're not interrogating them. So we're not modeling the system to show them how they can answer test questions. Um, or we run the risk of, if we're saying, um, where is not, show me not, or where is go, show me go. If that's how they're getting their system modeled, then they're going to learn that their communication system is what they use at school when they're being tested, rather than what they use when it's time to have a conversation. Um, and so what we're trying to do with these core words is really think about how to use them in conversation. And by waiting, by asking questions and then waiting and giving time, we're showing that it's not just a test question. We're going to give them the time because we really want to know what they're thinking. Fundamentally, we are providing communication systems for our kids because we desperately want to know what they're thinking. And we need to make sure that we're modeling the system in a way um, that invites that, that entices that. So we're going to ask them authentic questions and we're going to wait. And we're also going to model our own answers on the system, such as, our answer to where we might be going, that kind of thing, so that they have that model of how they would use the system to provide their own response. So remember while modeling where it's a conversation, not an interrogation. We're going to provide an expectant pause. For some of our kids, you only need to wait a second or two, and they're already organizing their bodies um, to sign or to gesture or to use their communication system to answer a question and respond. For others of our kids, we might need to count to 25. We might need to count to even higher to really give them that time. Um, and in the beginning, for our emergent kids, they might not have a response. We might provide that expectant pause, and we might not get a response at all, and that's OK. We're going to keep going there, too. Because we're just having a conversation. And when you have a conversation with someone, and they don't immediately respond, we all actually know how to keep the conversation going, maybe by providing more um, information or by providing a response ourselves, et cetera, right? So there's lots of ways we can do it, but we're going to make sure we provide that pause. We're going to invite the student to respond. So think of a question like, where should we go? Huh, where should we go? I'm going to model it where. I'm going to provide an expectant pause. I'm going to invite the student to respond. So to do that, I might open up whatever category they have in their system that shows locations of where we could go to. I'm going to, expect, I'm going to accept however they respond. So if they have a sign for something like their favorite place, then I'm going to accept that as their response. And when I answer, I'm going to reflect back um, both what they said and I'm going to provide my own response using their system. So here's just one example of um, an adult asking a student, so where would you like to put the snowman's hat? We're doing a craft activity at school. Um, and maybe the student hasn't been highly engaged, which sometimes happens with our kids, right? Um, especially if it seems like the whole world is set up where there's a right or wrong answer to everything. So maybe the student just looks briefly towards us, but doesn't provide um, immediate information about where they want this hat to go. So we might provide some opportunities, such as maybe here, maybe there. Pause. The student touches the page, and now we say, oh, that's where. So you can see how we would model that. Maybe there's a destination. So we ask, where should we go for dinner? And our student responds to that with something like signing, a sign like eat. And we say, yes, we're going to go eat, so where should we go? We might navigate to our places category, browse it, say out loud what we're seeing. Might, If we're still not getting a response from our student, we might make a selection. And then sometimes that's actually when we get um, our student's response. And remember, this isn't too different from when you say to a spouse or a partner, hey, where should we go eat? And they don't immediately jump in. And you say, oh, you know, I'm thinking pizza. And they say, actually, no, I was thinking tacos. Right? So it's, it's really the same conversational strategy we use with anybody. 
maybe our student um, really likes to talk about the people in his life. And so he regularly opens his people folder and just says people's names. That's a pretty common um, early communication behavior we see in our kids. So we say, oh, you say daddy. I wonder if you want, because we learned the word want a few months ago, so if you want to know where daddy is. And maybe our student just says daddy again. So we say, I know where daddy is. Daddy's at. And I go places in school. And now I've provided an invitation, and the student can go from there to say something else. Well, we'll see. So those are just some ideas um, for where. And Mary Louise will talk about uh, where and question words within the pod system um, in just a moment. But now we're going to look at up, on, and in. So these are words two, three, and four in our, in our current set of words. These are very high frequency words. And they're very action-based. They're very social. As we look at the ways in which we use words like up, on, and in, um, they tend to be words we use in the middle of activities. So these are really our opportunities for how we're going to use them with our kids. For example, bath time. Um, many of our students with Angelman love their bath time. So words like up, on, and in. So we're going to climb up into the bathtub. Um, now we're sitting on the bathtub. We do not stand on the bathtub. We get in the bathtub. We can start using words that we've already started modeling, such as I, you, and more to be pouring. Do you want me to pour more water in the tub? Right? Should I pour water on your head? Up goes the cup. I'm pouring it on you. Uh, we can model with crafts. The reason I've provided so many examples of crafts is how often we watch our kids in the classroom and maybe they're getting hand over hand support and they're producing some of the most beautiful crafts in their entire classroom, perfectly done, and our kids weren't actually a very active part of deciding how that craft was done. Um, for myself as a mother, whenever crafts come home and they look really good, I can tell you they go straight into the recycling bin because I have very little sense that Maggie was part of it. I would so much rather, when she was little and a snowman craft came home, that the pieces were all over the page and she had had words like up, on, and in modeled. So where would you like to have the hat to go? Where do you want the boots to go? Where should the nose go? And that she had directed someone to choose where those pieces went. That would have been so much more meaningful than um, if someone had just simply directed her hands for where to put things and sent that home, right? So there all these different activities we do in the class are just a beautiful opportunity to use these words. When we're doing activities like Play-Doh, um, we're going to put the cutter on the dough and we roll it out and then we're going to put the Play-Doh in. Should it go up, right? When we're playing with books and, and while reading, it can be as simple as, oh, the book's on my head, now the book's on your head. You know, show me where to start reading. At mealtime, I need you to come sit up at the table. Um, I'm going to put some food on your plate. What would you like on your plate? Oh, the milk is in your cup. It can be as simple as that. Uh, when we're going places, um, I need you to climb up into your car seat or climb up into the car. Um, I'm going to buckle you in. Really simple things. A lot of our kids like playing with light switches. So the light is on, and now it's not on. And now it's on, and now it's not on. So um, all I'm trying to get to there is just thinking about all these ways that we're actually probably already using those words up on and in without even realizing how often we're doing it. If we just become more aware of it, then we can start modeling. Uh, Carolyn and Mary Louise, did you have any other suggestions for this page? Uh, I think of having the PT involved in this, if your students are in PT or OT, and just sending a note to tell them that we're modeling these words. Because think about the PT, which do you want to do first? Do you want to go up the stairs or do you want to go in the hammock? Do you want to go on the swing or do you want to go so just all those opportunities that the PT can model and also give some choices. And then the OT might be doing some of those same kinds of, of craft activities, writing, Play-Doh, et cetera. That's awesome. Um, I think a, a lot of the families um, that I've been with the last year or so use a lot of the Toka Boca apps um, when they're yeah. Doing prepositions, um, the my, my play home. You know, we wonder where we're going to put her. Oh, put in, um, put on, um, directing all the people around. The the baking and cooking apps. Um, so you know, as the child 
for, especially for our really emergent communicators, as the children are engaging in the app, the parent or the teacher or the peer is modelling um, what they're seeing the child doing, so visually referencing what the child is doing. Oh, you're going to put her in there. Oh, put her on. Oh, she's going up. Um, I think you know we're coming into the season of mud pies and um, water play, and there's lots of you know pouring in, pouring on. Um, modelling there, you're going into snowmen season where you can put in noses and put on eyes and things. Um, so they're kind of the, the top activities that I sort of see families using these words with. Awesome. Remembering that we're modelling and then waiting, hoping to get that opportunity, but it's an invitation. It's not a demand, right? So we're looking for everything we can get from our kids so that they realize that they can direct us. Um, sometimes we look at, I just recently had a few questions about this. When would we model the opposite of a word versus when might we model not? So for example, this month we're looking at up, in, and on. And we haven't also emphasized down, um, out, and um, off, right? So at what point would we do one with the other? And I think that's a bit of a judgment call. I'd love to hear from uh, Carolyn and um, Mary Louise. But what I've just done here is said, if you're using a more limited word set, such as um, this DLM top 40 plus 5, um, if you don't have the opposites available, right? So you don't have, um, if we look at where in, on, and up are, we don't have the opposites, and so then we might look over and use not. And that's important for concept development for some of our more emergent kids anyway, that um, before you learn opposites, you often learn first what something is and what something's not, that things are same and different before you learn necessarily the concept of opposites. But if you've got a more robust system that has more symbols on the page, if you've got on and off, if you've got um, in and out, then you might do that. So looking at that beginner um, protocol page with 60 symbols on the page, we have both in and out on the page, but we don't have down and we don't have off. And so in those cases, we might just use the word not and indicate the opposite. Carolyn and Mary Louise, do you guys want to add anything? I very much agree, but I would also say having it be really fun where we we sometimes use puppets, so we're having the puppet do something, and of course it gets it wrong, and then we're like, that is not on, you know, so that we're able to, to really have fun with that. That's not on. You were supposed to put it on, the, and then we go back and, and, and do it right. So ha doing that type of thing can be a really fun activity, too. You're teaching... Like you said, you're teaching on by what is not on, and you're teaching in by what's not in, and just having way more fun with it than just the, it, it can be so, preposition can be so incredibly boring, and they can be so much fun. So thinking about doing obstacle courses, having your pet, your, your um, stuffed animals play around with different, uh, do, do, doing different uh, locations, and then having fun with that not. Mary Louise, do you want to add anything? Oh, um, yeah, I just, I suppose sometimes I get concerned that um, too often people jump to teaching concepts when the children have such emergent language. So I think, you know, as Caroline said, if you're making it fun of, um, you know, in, not in, um, uh, rather than um, show me how to turn it off. Now you show me how to turn it on, and they're ticking as to whether the child's got the concepts when the child has such early language that you kind of, I don't think you can assess those concepts so little. So I think keeping it fun um, and about the negation of, you know, in and on is kind of more important for most of the emergent um, people in the community. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. And really thinking about words like um, up, on, and in for student-directed activities. Trying to break away from all those activities that so many of our kids have spent so much of their time being directed what to do with kind of one correct way that they can do it. And instead thinking about um, the different games and, and activities, the opportunities for our students to direct adults and others using words like 
up on and in. And I think you've already heard a whole bunch of examples of how we would do that. So, so that's kind of my goal for those words as we're thinking about it, is really making it more student-directed, student-oriented, so it's fun um, and our kids are getting a chance to use their words to direct other people. And Mary Louise, I'm going to um, hand this over to you now. Okay, so you'll push the buttons. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so in terms of questions, okay, so if you turn the page, Erin. All right, so here's um, uh, one page opening, uh, what's this, 16 per page pod book. So just reminding everyone that when you're using light tech pod books, no matter what you're saying, if it's not on the front page, you have to follow the navigation pathways. We have to model those pathways because um, the children, uh, if we flick through the book, the children aren't learning how they can find the language. And again, when we've got high tech, we can't flick. We have to follow pathways. So, you know, if you have questions, more to say, turn the page, please, Erin. Uh, and then I'm asking a question um, so that you can see that's uh, two down in the first column. So I'm asking a question and that would take me to page eight, please, Erin. You're such a good page turner. Um, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> you're a very good smart partner. Um, so in um, a pod book like this, a 16 uh, per page, you've got your generic where question and in for our early um, language learners it's fine as we've discussed to just model where, um, where and then say the rest of the sentence yourself, where is daddy, um, where you know is the cat, um, where is the dog, uh, just using the where. You've also on this page got um, a cell for where are you going, where are we going, so um, we often model this a lot when the children um, are getting quite anxious or distressed about people are leaving the classroom, there's transition times, so um, we are modelling, I'm asking a question, where are we going? So we've got, the ch uh, we're modelling a way for the child to, to say, hang on, hang on, you know, where are we going? Then there's also in the pod books um, down the bottom um, of the third column, where is person. So when I touch where is, and that will link, it says go to page nine, there's a nine there, so now I turn to page nine please Erin. That's my people pages, so now I can say where is mum, where is dad, where is someone at school, where is a friend. Um, so you've got in the question um, pages of one page opening pods, you've got those words um, where where are we going, where are you going, and where is person? Okay, turn the page please, Erin. Uh, when you've got a two-page opening pod, okay, so this is um, 1B, so the second um, set of pages in a two-page opening pod, and you can see that um, in, a, in a 40 cell like this, you've got your category links on the left-hand side, and then um, you've got all your question words in that column. So there's your where. So then you can create the sentence left to right, just as you would um, with any other you know, robust AAC app. Um, where are you going? Where are I going? What, um, where you want to go? Uh, so that's a two-page opening pod. Can you turn the page, please, Erin? If I wanted to talk about where is a person in a two-page opening, I can start on 1B and do that, or I can just go straight to my categories, to my people's pa people page, and use my where, where is mum, you know, where he go, um, where you play, where um, dad go. So uh, I can use my category of people with my predictably associated vocabulary of question words there to find my where. All right, next page please, Erin. On the pod 15 and the 15 plus, this is your home page. So when you're focusing on where over the next week, you need to go through your I'm asking a question um, branch and that will take you to, turn the page please, Erin, take you to your question page. So. Um, again, if you're going to just 
do your generic where, I'm asking a question, where? There's your generic where. If you want to combine that to, you know, where is the doll? Where is the dog? Um, then uh, where shall we go? Then you need to go through to categories um, and that will take you to, um, can you just turn the page please, Erin? Okay, so there's page um, A of the category. So there you can say where and then you can connect that idea of um, joining the second part of your sentence, you know, animals for dog or um, pl uh, places for where you want to talk about where you're going. As Erin was saying, when you're scaffolding the children to different restaurants, oh, where do you think we should go? Oh, let's go to our restaurants page. And that's how you use your categories page to combine those ideas and support the children to um, contribute to the discussion. Uh, turn the page, please, Erin. Uh, if we're doing where is person, like in the one page opening pods, we had the where is person and it had the nine and we had to turn to the people page. In um, high tech pod, you have a where is person button and when I push that and Erin turn, magically turns it, then I get my people page. So there I can say where is mum, where is um, going to my friends. Um, box, going to my family box, going to my school people folder um, and that's how I'm combining those ideas of where is. Uh, okay, next please Erin. Okay, on the 15 plus again you're, um, you're using your, I'm asking a question branch starter, turn the page please Erin. But you'll see the question page has, um, so on the first column on the left hand side you've now got people pronouns, question actions and your little words. So as we get into the fifth, using the 15 plus we've got more language um, and language is broken down to, into um, uh, more of the little words, the little actions and we're actually putting the sentences together um, rather than just speaking in keywords. You've got those functions there in the 15 plus. You're, you've still got your where and your where is person because um, they're important still. Okay, next please, Erin. And then if you're using the pod 60, your question words are top up there. So that, that's where you will find your question words. Um, so if you're modelling questions over the next week and you're using the 60, then that's going to be the cell that you, if you choose to highlight it or choose to, you know, put a, a sticker on it or whatever you want to do, as Erin um, was talking about for the proloquo to go. Okay, next please, Erin. So if we talk about up, on and in, in pod communication books, so again, I need to, t at the one level books, on, up, in, off, around, under, over, those words are predictably associated with an action. So as Erin was talking about these are our action words, we need to access these words through our actions folder. So again it would be more to say and then turn to page two and then I need my do something folder and the do something folder often gets neglected but it's a wonderful folder full of awesome things, all our important action words. So we go to do something and there's our 10A so we're on page when our action folder now, now I need to turn the page and there we go. So I can con combine the words put it on um, put in, uh, turn on, uh, get it in. Um, so in the pod systems in the 12, um, 16 and 20, this is the kind of page that you're going to be looking at. Accessing, oh, more to say, do something, turn the page, let's turn it on, let's put it in. Um, so that's the kind of language you're going to be using over the next week when you're doing things like your um, apps, your puzzles, your cooking, um, doll play. Where should we put the dolly? Let's put her in. Um, let's uh, put her. Oh, put her blanket on. That kind of um, 
language. Okay, so turn the page, please, Erin. So that was the uh, was the sixteen. So here we go. This is just to show the twelve per page. You've still got these words. So again, it was more to say, do something. Turn the page. Thanks, Erin. And there's my words again: in, on, out, and off. Um, so put in, turn on, put on, put it in. Um, and there's that all important not that we're talking about when we're modeling early language where we're teaching the concepts at the same time but the most important thing is that we're immersing in language so if, if the child puts it in we can say oh you put it in now if they take it out we can say oh you take it out oh no it's not in it's out uh oh so we're teaching the concepts through language so it is important that we have that not that don't oh it can't go in it's stuck uh oh maybe I have to turn it a bit so you've got that language there that you can sit um, and and play with the dolls with your cooking you can use those action words to get that generalization of language across the day uh, I think a lot of our families feel they have to have an aided language display or they have to go into their dolly page to talk about dolly things, that they have to go into their cooking page to talk about cooking things. The more we show the children that actually I can use these words across the day, then this folder, um, this branch starter in pod becomes really powerful. So, you know, absolutely use your, your doll pages, your puzzle pages, your blocks pages but also push yourself to try and use the do something branch starter as well. Okay, turn the page please, Erin. Uh, and again, if you've got a two page opening pod, you're going to access these words through actions. Um, unless you've got one of the more advanced like 70 or the 100, but uh, not many of our children have, uh, or our adults have those at this time, so we'll just talk about the 40. So again, I've gone to actions. I need to turn the page. And there's all my words. In, on, off, put in, turn on. Ooh, tip in. Oh, there's a good one. Fill in. Let's fill all the water in. Um, all right, and if we go to, so if we talk about actions now using the do something branch starter on high tech. Turn the page, please, Erin. So we've had a look at questions on high tech. Now we need to go and look at that bright pink branch starter of do something. Um, that We've got verbs across the day that we can use. So on the pod 15, do something will take you to your page, your first page of actions. So we need to turn the page. Now it's predictably associated. Remember that those in, on, out, off, under, over are going to come with the verbs turn, put and take. So at the early language level. So if you can see that turn, put and take have become folders. So when I touch turn, when I touch put, when I touch take, um, so if I pretend I put touch put, then it's going to activate a pop-up. So I can say, put it in, put on. Um, so there, that's how I'm accessing those little words, those prepositions in the 15. Um, okay, thank you, Erin. Turn the page. Now, if, I've got, if I'm using the 15 plus, I'm still using the do something branch starter. That's my focus for this week. I'm asking the question, where, oh, where should I put it? Oh, I'm going to do something. Okay, turn please, Erin. Now I have the choice now I can use my little words. So all throughout um, uh, the 15 plus, you will find on, in, under, over, around, those words in little words. So yes, they're in actions. And if we go to um, touch that, we see that actions pop up. And we've got a lot more positional language here, there, over. We've got our time words. We've got our amount words, many, some, all. Uh, but also those pop-ups are going to be throughout the um, the page set of the 15 plus. So on all the main pages, activities, places, um, clothing, I'm going to have a little words pop-up, little words folder that will bring that pop-up up. 
So for the families who are using the 15 plus, this is how you can start using those words in, on, throughout the day, no matter what folder you're in. Can you turn the page please, Erin? Again, so here's our activities page. You can see our little words um, folder is there. So I can say I want to rest in something. I want to rest on something. Um, and again, please, Erin. Okay, and it's just sh showing that in your um, questions page, you've got a little words folder there as well in the 15 plus. Um, so if you want to say, where should we go on the tram? Where should we go? Oh, I'm putting in. He's going in. Where should we go in the in the train? Where should we sit on the train? Then there's your little words there. Uh, and turn the page, please, Erin. Uh, again, if you're using the pod 60, we have uh, a number of children and adults using the 60. So you're going to find your green little words folder down the bottom. Um, and the last page I'll show you is just where what that pop-up looks like. And then you will find in, out, on, off on the right-hand side in the last three columns. So that's where you'll find your um, core vocabulary this week in the pod books. So focus on your where through asking a question. Um, remembering always to start it on the main page um, or on in the high tech uh, and light tech. Um, and using your uh, do something branch starter to find your put in, put on, take out, take on, take in, tip in, those kind of things. All right. Does that make sense? Awesome. All right, Carolyn, and now it goes to you. I'm going to switch the screen over. Okay. All righty. Okay, is my screen now visible? It is. Great. Okay, so, so let me... Uh, move to the next page. We're going to talk about some reading fun with the core four set um, using those four, four words where, on, in, and up. And so let's just jump in and we're going to read some books that highlight those words. You can do a search for the word where in Tar Heel Reader, for example, or the word in, the word on. Search for prepositions. There are just tons of preposition books out there. Some are really, really cute and fun and others are really boring, so you need to look and review which ones would be really fun for your students. And so one of the things to remember, I just want to caution us, that we're just reading the book with your child first. We're not using that AAC system to read word by word. Then we're talking about the pages. Okay, we're not saying you're reading, telling your child to read it or having you read every word using the AAC system. We're just having fun reading the book and then we're talking about the book and we'll highlight those key words. And so I made a book that I just posted at Tar Heel Reader and we'll also post it um, on the Angelman website just called Where is Santa? And here's a short part of the Where is Santa book. And when you're reading it, have fun with it. Where is Santa? He's up. Where is Santa? He's on his cycle. You go. And why did I add you go? Because it's fun, but also you is one of our, our key words and go is a very highly used word. Where is Santa? He's in the field. And, and then we can stop and just talk about that. It's not just about the words in and on and up. It's about having fun talking about this book and talking about, whoa, that's a silly looking Santa. And, you know, I wonder what he's doing. We can go back to our what word. Oh, he, that is not a real Santa, is it? So just having lots of fun talking about it. But we're also talking about our key words. Where is Santa? Help! He's stuck in the chimney. So that's our last page of the book. There's actually more pages than the one you can download. So just having so much fun reading. And oh yes, we get to practice those key words that we're working on this week. Another thing that's going to happen as you go look, you'll find sample books that are close 
but no cigar. If you're looking for a book and it's really close, but it's not quite right because you need a different topic for your child. Or the keywords aren't really in there. You've got some great pictures, but it hasn't doesn't really use the keywords. So I was looking at, when I looked up where, I found where is Spider-Man. I bet there's somebody out here, there who's child loves Spider-Man. So this would be a great time to just type in, yes, yeah, Spider-Man, my kid loves Spider-Man. Um, so here's how it starts. It's by J.K. Reading. Isn't that, isn't that cute? Get it? J.K. Rowling. So where is Spider-Man? Spider-Man, up! Look up! So that's isn't that great? We've got that word up, and look is a, is a word that will be coming up. It's one of our uh, top 40. Spider-Man, down! Look down! Okay, and then it keeps going on, and it, the rest of the words really aren't at all related to what we're doing, but the pictures are fabulous. So what you do is you can just literally download that book and then change it, and change the words to match what your student needs. So how would we change this? Instead of calling it Red Spider-Man, let's just download it. It's a PowerPoint that, oh gosh, that means you can do Save As and have it be a Spider-Man um, core four book, and then we could have it say Spider Man is so. Okay, type in there. What would you say about Spider Man? How would we use our core words about where, up, in, and on? So, any ideas getting typed in, Amy? So while you guys are thinking, the, one of the things I would say is to just do, um, when we're saving as, we're taking that slide that says, where is Spider-Man, uh, Spider and we're interspersing it every couple of pages. So we say, where is Spider-Man? Up, look up, Spider-Man. Where is Spider-Man? And then Spider on, Spider-Man is on the ice. So those types of things. Um, this one was bad Spider-Man. And that's that's very fun, and that bad is a, a nice high frequency word. But well, how would we change it for this book? And this would be a great place to add in the word up. So just taking word, uh, books that are already there, you don't have to spend any time doing it, and then making them fit our needs. It's also really fun though to make your own book. So we were talking about doing things like have an obstacle course where everybody in the family has to be doing different things like then your students tell them go up and people have to go up the stairs and then um, uh, on and then they have to find something to get on and they do in and we have we have like a large box there and we have a cu cupboard that you could or a closet you could go in. While you're doing those activities or while they're doing these activities with their own uh, toys or superheroes or whatever, take pictures and then write your own books. Think about what your kids love. If they do Spider-Man, take pictures of Spider-Man up and in and on and then make a book about that. If your child loves um, their, they, let's say you have a, a little little dog, make your dog do go fun little places and get in the hat and, and on the bed and and up high in the air and then take pictures of it and make a book. So I used to travel for years with Speedy and this is Speedy, he's my little road runner and so I did a Where is Speedy book and I put it on Tar Heel Reader and again we'll post it at the Angelman site. So where is Speedy? He's on the vine, chill out. Where is Speedy? He's in the hammock, cool. Where is Speedy? He's on the viewer, what do you see? Where's Speedy? He's way up. He's up, up, up. Get down, Speedy. So just having fun with the, with the critters or animals or with your own family and really just hamming it up, being really crazy for the camera, taking pictures and then going in and making a book that gives your child something else to read and something else to talk about and something else to model those fun keywords. So now, Aaron, uh, you, I'll turn it back over to you. Let's see, do, uh, change presenter. Aaron Sheldon, okay. Make Aaron Sheldon the presenter, okay. 
All right. Well, I hope that gave you guys um, just a lot of ideas about how we can have fun with words that maybe on the very face of it um, don't appear as the most fun and engaging words possible. And that's always the challenge with core words, right? I mean, core words, when you first look at them, you go, really? <laughs> because it'd be so much more fun to do this activity using words like cookies. But you can see how... Um, it's how we use the words, right? It's the activities we do them, and it's making sure we're just doing really fun, um, silly things. And Carolyn has been the master of finding um, those really engaging activities that just get our kids so excited. Um, in terms of upcoming webinars, uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback from folks about um, what they would like to see in this series and just kind of what your barriers are to being able to, um, to follow it. And here's what we've heard of the most. Um, a number of folks, a number of you already have Prolo to Go, but you didn't have a core word vocabulary and um, you're struggling to follow the system, um, the series. Um, because you had maybe a beginner user. Um, other folks have told us that, okay, I've purchased an app such as Proloquo, but I haven't figured out how to get started. Um, so we have asked the folks at Proloquo to go to do a special webinar for us. We expect that's going to be uh, next Tuesday at noon, but I'll announce that for sure later today. Um, we are also going to do a webinar on getting started with POD because, again, we've heard from a number of folks where this is the, the tool that's been selected by the team, but they would just kind of like um, more help getting started or maybe they've purchased the software um, or purchased the app but haven't yet been able to get started. So we're expecting that within the next two weeks or so, so watch for that if that's your... Um, if that's your particular interest. We're also hearing from a lot of people um, that maybe you have fallen behind on the series and you started out and you got all the way through the first month or the second month, but now you've fallen behind and people just asking for help. Um, how can they catch up or how can they start now? We've heard from folks who, um, for Christmas, they're buying an iPad with a communication app for their child and they really want to get started with the series but um, can't really get caught up on four months worth of webinars. So we are working on some materials and a webinar specifically for that, how you can kind of join the series late. And if there's anything else that you're hearing from folks, if you're hearing from members of your child's school team or if you're hearing from other parents, anyone, um, kind of very specific topics that um, people would like covered, then we will cover them. We just need to hear from you. Possible next steps, think about an activity um, to, that would just kind of engineer that opportunity for you to use the core for. So you saw lots of books here. You can download those books from Carolyn and we'll share them in the Facebook group. Um, so choose a book, choose an activity, um, but just have some fun because remember the focus of whatever you choose is the activity and not the words, right? We're layering the words on top of the fun we're having with our kids. And share your experiences in the Facebook group, whether it's going well or whether it's not working well. Share your experiences because I doubt any of you are experiencing anything completely unique. Um, we're all coming up against the same, the same issues and we'll only know that if we share it. Um, so we can take some questions now, but while you guys are writing your I'll just say that the ASF Communication Training Series is made available by the Angelman Syndrome Foundation through a generous grant from the Foster Family Charitable Foundation um, based in Central California. <laughs>